During my time as uh, Chief Executive of Parks Victoria, I had the privilege of working with quite a few traditional owner groups right across Victoria on a, a range of er issues in an exciting era when government was very keen on handing over responsibility. We did have an uh, uh, informal target of, um, by now, 80% of Victoria's national parks would be under co-management. We haven't quite, quite got there. So I'd like to acknowledge all of the traditional owners in forested areas in Victoria and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, Melissa asked the question, and I think some earlier speakers did, about what is forest health, a very contested area. Um, but I recall many years ago, uh, I was visiting a forest on the border between the United States and Canada uh, in the east with a, a group of um, foresters and uh, traditional owners, the Mohawk people, and the foresters said they had 109 indicators of forest health. And I asked the chief uh, what did he consider was a good forest health, and his response was the number of people that come out smiling. Um, so th maybe there's something for, there for us, us to uh, learn. Ian asked me to sp speak about an international perspective. Uh, very difficult to do that in, uh, in 20 mi minutes. Um, particularly um, is um, that there's just so much that's happening internationally and has been happening for the last 20, 30 years on international forest policy and international institutions that are relevant to forest in general uh, and parts of that are very relevant to forests in Victoria. Uh, you might be surprised at the sheer number of, uh, of in, in, institutional arrangements, institutions and processes. Um, these include, and I'm just not very good at making PowerPoint slides, but they, um, at the big level, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and I'll talk about both of those, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, there's, uh, there's two scientific bodies that go with that, the inter Intergovernmental um, Science and Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a big mouthful, uh, known as IPBES, and there's also the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, in addition to that, there's many, many processes such as the UN Decade on Restoration, um, there's the United Nations Forum on Forests, and there's a number of other conventions that are relevant to what Victoria does. There's also work uh, on forests by UN uh, intergovernmental and non-governmental organisations, and I know some of you uh, represent non-government organisations here. Uh, they often have uh, international counterparts. And forest processes, Rod mentioned one, forest landscape restoration, um, but there's also a thing called Global Forest Watch, uh, the Montreal Protocol, and a, a range of certification processes. Some of them are primarily about forest industry, but there's also things like the IUCN Green List on protected areas. Um, so I don't have time to cover all of those. I just wanted to, you to get a flavour that there's many, many of them. So I've chosen just a few that I think are probably most relevant uh, that you can consider when you're thinking about the future of that 1.8 million hectares of Victoria's forest, or perhaps uh, the entire uh, set of Victoria's forest, because uh, in my view, we shouldn't be compartmentalising forests. We should look holistically all forest, all forest type, all forest area. Uh, there's no point dividing it up under tenures. Um, so according to the uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, um, and the IPCC, that two of the most pressing challenges are climate change and biodiversity. No surprise, perhaps, to all of you in this room. But an important finding of those two international science groups is that these two things need to be dealt with in an interconnected manner. Um, and that's, and we've heard from speakers, scientists this morning, not an easy thing to do because it's very complex. Uh, forests are very complex, not just biophysically, but also sociologically. Um, and the, the um, IPBES and IPCC note that the nature of complex systems is that they have unexpected outcomes. And they also have things called thresholds. If you go beyond the threshold, uh, the situation will change sometimes permanently. Um, but also 
the individual parts of a complex system can't be managed in isolation from the other parts. That, to me, is a critical thing for you to be thinking about for the future of Victoria's forests. So we can't just manage on a species-by-species -species basis. As important as managing threatened species is, there's many other things that we have to consider as we go through. So the, the problem with those two, the intertwined challenges, is they reduce the capacity of, uh, of nature, uh, including forests, to generate um, ecosystem services. So from an a, a economic and social point of view, those services are critical to our future and they provide for human well-being. And so first message that I really want to get across is whatever you do going forward, you need to do it in an interconnected manner. Um, I, I think currently in Victoria, that's not the case. It's being dealt with separately in ter terms of jurisdictions and in terms of issues, um, in terms of engagements. The first big, big uh, area really brought on the international agenda is a thing called the uh, United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, that has a focus on climate change, it has a focus on biodiversity loss, and it also has a focus on human wellbeing, the three key issues. Um, and the, within that uh, framework, they have a 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, as they're generally referred to. And there's two that I think are worth mentioning in this arena. First is uh, goal number 13, which calls for urgent action on climate change, and the second is goal 15, to protect, restore and promote sustainable, sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, uh, sustainable managed forests, to combat desertification and halt and reverse land degradation and biodiversity loss. So the extent that forest management in Victoria can contribute to those two goals depends on how effective actions are towards mitigating climate change in relation to forest and in terms of how well you can protect biodiversity. And within that, whether you can manage trade-offs and avoid um, those negative trade-offs um, with those management decisions. So the, the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate change includes three elements, the convention itself, a thing called the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol. And the objective of those three agreements is to stabilise greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, that to um, avoid dangerous human interference with the climate system, and within a time frame that allows ecosystems to adapt naturally and ensures sustainable development. Key words there, adapt naturally. Um, the UNFCC is relevant to the three big challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, human well-being. Um, and that, that the Paris Agreement includes a, a number of key things, some more relevant than others to you, a long-term long temperature goal to limit global temperature to well below two degrees Celsius increase. Um, currently, Victoria has experienced 1.2 degrees since the <coughs> Industrial Revolution. So we're well on the way to two degrees and probably globally well on the way past two degrees. Um, they have a thing called global peaking for greenhouse gases, um, work on mitigation, a uh, thing called sinks and reservoirs, which they also include specifically forests in that, and uh, adaptation to strengthen resilience and reduce vulnerability. So as we've heard this morning, Victoria's forests have a critical role to play uh, in climate mitigation uh, and in um, it, the management of those will determine how well those forests can adapt to climate change. Um, one of the key things that needs to be considered in that is the interaction between climate change and the fire regime. So, Climate change is probably exacerbating uh, large-scale uh, catastrophic, catastrophic landscape fires. Catastrophic landscape fires are contributing to climate change. 
So we, we get a self-reinforcing cycle. The, the IPCC notes that in the long term, a sustainable forest management strategy um, aims um, at maintaining increased forest carbon stocks while producing an, an annual sustained yield of timber, fibre or energy from the forest will generate the largest sustained mitigation benefit. Probably a very contested statement. It's not my statement, it's the IPCC statement, uh, but it is something worth looking at. And I think Rod mentioned that is you know, what do you need to do with forest if you want to um, generate the largest mitigation effort? And how do you do that without causing uh, loss of biodiversity is, is a very difficult uh, area that needs to be looked at. Coming to that in a second. So what's clear is um, the role of Victoria's forests in climate change and adaptation, adaptation needs to be guided by evidence. And particularly in the climate arena, uh, misinformation, selective use of data, inappropriate extrapolation of evidence from local scale to landscape and beyond um, is confusing policy makers and the public. And confused politicians results in confused policy or absence of policy. So I'm going to say a little bit more about that at the end of my talk, but I think it is a big challenge to make sure that the evidence that you're using is, is uh, contestable, but it's also the best available. So moving from climate change to the biodiversity, the Convention on Biological Diversity um, also is relevant to the three issues, climate change, biodiversity, human wellbeing. Um, and they, uh, last year, they approved um, a thing called the Kunming Montreal Global Biode Biodiversity Framework. Uh, this framework probably provides you with a, quite a useful guidance on the sort of things you need to consider in future forest management in Victoria. It's got uh, four long-term goals. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention two of them and uh, that I think are the, of the greatest relevance. The, the first one, oop, where did I get to? Goal A, we better go back to A. Goal A is about the integrity and connecti connectivity. Uh, it's also, um, uh, it's about uh, threatened species and about genetic diversity. And all three of these sub-goals are relevant to forest management. We've heard quite a bit today about uh, a little bit about connectivity and resilience. We've heard quite a lot about species. We haven't heard so much about genetics, but it is of critical importance, particularly as forests become more and more fragmented or more and more exposed to climate change uh, we, we need, and particular species declining. Uh, there are challenges with genetic diversity. Goal B is about uh, biodiversity being sustainably used and managed, um, and again, including its contribution to human well-being. And they talk about ecosystem functions and ecosystem services in that goal. Um, the, and the role that those functions and services play in uh, sustainable development. And I think that goal B in particular raises some interesting questions for you. Which ecosystem functions and services are you seeking to maintain and enhance? Not clear to me. How are those functions and services valued? Not clear. Who will benefit or lose and to what extent from the changes in these functions? Somebody will lose, somebody will benefit. Who are those people? Where, where do they live? Do urban populations benefit at the cost of regional Victoria? Do regional people benefit at the cost of urban? These things in a political process all need to be thought through. Um, within that, um, those big goals of the CBD, um, there's a number of targets, and I'll just mention a couple of them quickly. Target two is 30% uh, of areas degraded uh, terrestrial, inland, water and marine are under effective restoration. and. Um, Victoria can contribute to that target, I think, um, restoration along with silviculture and prescribed fire, invasive species management are, are key tools. And um, there's an international process on what's called forest landscape restoration. I think that can also perhaps, uh, some of the things in there might be useful for you in your considerations. 
Um, one of the interesting things about I find about forest landscape re restoration, it talks about balancing um, ecosystem ecological functioning and human well-being. Um, and there's one interpretation, my interpretation, I borrowed it, but about those interrelationships between those things. And I think um, here that understanding that ecological functionality, which includes biodiversity, but also processes, uh, influences what sort and how much the flow of ecosystem services are. And in turn, that has benefits or not for people. Uh, and then people in the bottom have responses. And here today, we've been talking about responses. So if you want to optimise the flow of certain ecosystem services, you need to understand how different forest management re regimes will affect that. Um, in the, um, in the case of Victoria, I think you're witnessing major shifts in uh, a natural disaster regime, in particular fire. And it, uh, recently I heard that over 4.9 million hectares of Victoria's forest have burnt in the last 20 years. You've only got 8 million hectares of forest. <laughs> so, it, you know, that, that sort of burning regime can't, cannot be sustained. I think the, it's... Uh, it's a call for a major rethink about how those forests are managed, and we heard that from several speakers already today. So some of the, I think we've heard people talk about management interventions, but some uh, may be necessary to have adaptive and active forest management more thought through. We need to address historical legacies. There's uh, land clearing, uh, the impact of, of forest operations, uh, reduction in hollow bearing trees, for example, uh, in disruption of indigenous fire regimes. Um, need to deal with invasive species across the landscape and improve connectivity and identify critical refugia area for things like mountain ash, alpine ash that might get squeezed uh, into uh, tighter and tighter areas because of climate change. Um, there's also opportunities for re-establishing degraded forest, reintroducing species, um, and perhaps uh, applying silvicultural options that create uh, hollows for trees uh, earlier than they would naturally. Um, work of Patrick Baker comes to mind there. And um, recognising that some interventions undoubtedly are going to be controversial. One thing I will say, the third target is about 30% of terrestrial areas should be under protection. Um, Victoria is, uh, is not there yet. Um, the, uh, you, I think if you, it depends on where your measurement is. Pre-1750, you're about 18% of forest is protected. It looks pretty good if it's post-1750, <coughs> it's about 45 or something percent of Victoria, but it's... Um, but I do want to say that simply, that's a minimum target the CBD has, simply pay, placing forest into the protected area system is not a guarantee of effective management. And I say that as a previous director of National Parks for Victoria. <laughs> it, unless, unless those agencies that manage forests have got the authority, the resources, the social licence, they they're unable to manage forests effectively. And th at the moment, I think, as Rod has said also, there's, there's a lack of shared vision. There's, there's not a strong social licence for a lot of things. Uh, even if you manage parks, uh, dealing with invasive species is often extremely controversial, uh, very difficult to do, and uh, it means we have suboptimal sub management approaches. Uh, because you spend a lot of time getting approvals and dealing with the public rather than dealing with the issues. Um, uh, there's um, there's uh, certainly opportunities, I think, that um, to improve the system. You know, we've heard these already today, recognising all forest values, not just focusing on one or two, but everything a forest can, can uh, provide and uh, having... Um, agreement on what you're trying to do with them. I think there's an important opportunity to promote uh, traditional owner responsibility and world views to manage those forests. Um, obviously, you need to, um, to address um, uh, uh, climate change. Um, I, I do want to just say something. Michael Sean Fletcher and his team have done some interesting work recently and published on fire regimes. Um, so we heard 
from two people this morning about fire regimes. Uh, you know, I think what Michael has uh, and his team have put out really quite interesting and challenging, uh, that Aboriginal communities did used to burn quite a lot. Uh, but I don't think Michael had in or his team said they burnt wet forests. Uh, so I think Chris is quite right that uh, these things are complex and there were different things in different places. And uh, it's, that's why I think it's very important not to not to extrapolate uh, one bit of research to across the whole estate. Uh, we need to understand what that research findings relates to. Um, and um, I, I do know um, in, in terms of traditional owners, the Victorian traditional owner corporations recently called for traditional owners to be enabled, empowered and resourced to apply cultural knowledge to the management of forested country, a, a view that I would strongly, um, strongly support. I thought my speech was only going to be 18 minutes, but obviously I talk too much. Um, I, I think that you know there is opportunity for apt, a, adaptive and active uh, forest management. Um, some of that might be contested, but there's also an opportunity that, um, as we've heard, matching Western science with Indigenous knowledge, I think that's a critical issue, uh, to inform policy and to help broader society understand uh, what are you trading off when you're making these decisions about um, forest management? Lastly, um, in my experience, I think reliance on people's opinions and listening to views that generate mistrust in scientific evidence can lead to policy and management decisions that are suboptimal and generally deliver perverse outcomes for the state and for Australia. Um, they also can undermine efforts to conserve biodiversity, address climate change and, and meet uh, social needs. So I encourage you in this forum and when you go forward is to apply critical thinking, challenge the evidence for sure, uh, but also actively listen to what people have to say. Thank you.